there and welcome to the Jitex Tech Waves podcast. This is where we focus on trends and innovations in the shifting tides of tech worldwide. Now, I'm Georgia Tolley, and today we are broadcasting to you live from Jitex Global, of course, in the Dubai World Trade Center. And on day two of Jitex Global, you really can tell this is the biggest tech show in the world. We've got thousands of people streaming past our broadcasting booth. And I'm delighted to say that we are managing to grab a few of the expert speakers to come and join us right here on our podcast. And our guest right now is Ashley Woodbridge, who is CTO for Lenovo, uh, right here in the Middle East, but also in Africa and Turkey. And today we are going to talk about smart cities and the role of artificial intelligence in urban infrastructure and utilities. An absolutely fascinating subject. So Ashley, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. It's great to be here. It's good to have you. Now, uh, the word smart city are thrown around a lot and they're thrown around a lot in Dubai, but I'm not sure everyone is entirely clear what that means. Perhaps you could enlighten us from your perspective. Sure. And I think it's changed and evolved over time. So, you know, if we look back a lot of time, uh, if you look back a few years ago, we were so excited to have smart parking and being able to just see where we were parking. But now with the infusion of AI, we're really finding it's about how do you make a city that's cognitive and can actually real time react to the changing situations of the city, but ultimately just give a better experience for all of us, right? At the end of the day, the city should serve us as the citizens. And I think that's the ultimate goal. So it's quite exciting times. What are the actual challenges that you perceive that artificial intelligence could potentially solve? I mean, the exciting thing is, is I really think it's endless, right? So, you know, we have, we, we've been working with cities across the region that have been doing it from the point of operational efficiencies. So uh, a fascinating use case was looking at what we call visual pollution. So all of those signs that you see on the freeways advertising that business that, you know, really detract from the look of the city. Well, how can we leverage things like garbage trucks to be constantly looking around the city to make sure you know the city is pristine, there's no violations in terms of things like signage, these sort of things, and then right through to how do we make a more sustainable city? How do we make sure that you know there's not water leakage, that floodwaters are cleaned up quickly so mosquitoes don't uh, breed, and all of these sort of things. So really, our approach at Lenovo is to sort of go to these city planners ask them what their most challenging problem is, and then work backwards from there. And most of the times there's a way that AI can help. That's very cool. How about in the concept of you know, development, uh, especially in a city like Dubai that is still developing so quickly, but I suppose in some ways it would be more complicated for cities that are already you know, quite well established. You know, how can AI help create more livable and sustainable cities? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, that's the exciting thing about <clears throat> being in the Middle East is you don't have that legacy. So we've done a lot of work with uh, the city of Barcelona. And as you said, right, you know, you can do certain things, but then you have all of the historical elements that you need to sort of manage around and whatnot. So and I imagine only part of that is above ground. I don't uh, like absolutely, that's the other right. Thing. I can't yeah. even imagine how deep you have to go to uh, dig yeah. up some of the archaeological things there and whatnot. Um, but Dubai, you've got a good point. So, you know, one of the things that we're seeing with AI um, is, and this is a sort of crossover with the metaverse, so to speak, is the, bil- the ability to now to build city-sized digital twins where we can actually, before the first uh, hole is dug, design the entire city and then being able to use the very sophisticated physics models, be able to look what would happen if it rains. Where would the water go? What would happen if a building was to catch on fire? How would the smoke actually go up through the building? So now we don't have to make that trial and error mistake of building the city, then discovering that there was a traffic issue or building the city and realizing that there's not enough access for emergency city, uh, emergency services. We can now do all of that planning visually 3D, so you don't need to be a tech wizard to be able to sort of see what's going on and then translate that into the operational plan. So we're seeing that you get the city right the first time versus sort of having to do trial and error over and over again, which is pretty exciting because there's so many new cities popping up that getting it right the first time is certainly uh, 
very cost effective, let's say. Absolutely. I mean, of course, one of those, I suppose one of the key components of any smart city, any digital twin is the data you need to build that. First of all, it has to be accurate data. But then you do get into the field of maybe data privacy. And, and that is the difficulty with artificial intelligence. 100%. You, know, you get these amazing benefits, but in exchange, you do have to hand over an awful lot of information. How can we ensure the sort of the responsible and I guess the ethical use of citizens data when building these type of smart cities? Yeah, that's a, it's a great point. And I think a lot of that starts with taking a sovereign principle sort of approach, which is, you know, we believe that not only the data, but the AI intelligence belongs to the citizens, belongs to the country. And that's why, you know, it's Lenovo, we have this belief that we're a global company, but we need to act locally. So we do a lot of programs working with local AI innovators to make sure that the model, the explainability, all of the things that help to make it responsible AI is done in country all the time by citizens of that country to make sure that there's not a risk that this data is then leaking to foreign adversaries or these sort of things. But back to your point, we're getting a lot better now at the privacy preserving element. So, you know, it's not so much what you're doing as an individual, it's your behaviors at an aggregate. That is what a city cares about. Uh, to put it another way, you know, we all think we're super interesting, but at the end of the day, when it comes to planning a city, I don't really care if it's you or the person next to you. So we're now able to put a lot of anonymization into these sort of AI solutions to protect that privacy, but still understand the overall behaviors and the ebb and flow of the city. I am absolutely fascinated by what you just said from a, from a geopolitical perspective, because of course, if you're managing waterways, you're managing internet connections, you're managing electricity on a, on a city-wide basis, for bad actors, that would be very interesting indeed. So, absolutely, yeah. and it's not just the bad actors, you know, for us, Another thing that's important for us is we don't want a way, we don't want a world where there's the AI haves and the AI have nots. For, for us, it's about really getting AI to the hands of everyone, you know, starting from school students, making sure their next generation of laptops has the capabilities that they could be the next data scientist, they could be the next AI innovator. Because the last thing that we want is, you know, uh, furthering the digital divide by, you know, only certain countries having access to this technology and other countries not being able to have access to that technology. So that's super important for us. Is it easy to democratize that type of data to make it, you know, make it accessible for all? Or, you know, does it require quite high tech machines ultimately? I mean, it's a good point. So open data is an important thing. Um, and that's not always easy because there's a lot of value in the data. So mm -hmm. we do see a trend that people want to monetize the data, which normally sees a sort of closed ecosystem. But certainly one of the positive things we're seeing is, you know, uh, once upon a time to get any in insights, it would be a PhD level quant or a physics engineer you would need to be able to look at the data and kind of find the insights. But now if you look at something like ChatGPT or these sort of things, you're, it's now got the capability where you could even point it to the data, ask English level questions and get very advanced analysis. So one of the democratizations we're seeing is through the use of things like large language models, now you're being able to put those deep analytical skills in the hands of people that don't necessarily have a computer science degree, aren't mathematicians, which is really great because then city planners can do they turn their vision back it by you know this data analytics and then be able to make the right decision. So it's hap the democratization is happening in a weird way, but we definitely see it happening. I mean, that's one sort of exciting emerging trend. Are there any others that have caught your eye in? smart city development when you know when we're talking about artificial intelligence sure um so i think probably the other thing that's super interesting is you know certainly in the middle east you know we've always had a lot of cctv cameras from a security point of view but now what we're seeing is with ai getting so advanced with what we call computer vision we're now seeing all of these cameras that have been all over the city as being a new data source so before we would just have sensors now we can use cameras and everything you and I can see now becomes a data source, which really means now all of the tasks that we used to do can now be you know, quantified into data. 
and then we can make decisions off that. So it's really sort of giving the funnel of data has gone up like a thousand times, and that's just opening up more and more use cases that were never feasible before. So I think the use of computer vision in the city space is opening a, a tremendous amount of opportunity. That's really exciting because, I mean, there are, especially in the city of Dubai and, and, and the wider UAE, there are a lot of cameras. So you can imagine the amount of information that they could get from those. I mean, obviously, <laughs> in order for all of this to work, we're going to have to have skilled professionals to, you know, to process the data, to analyze the data, to, to read, you know, the results ultimately and then create strategies accordingly. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe there's a parent listening to this who would be like, well, I might want my child to get involved in that. They're studying architecture at the moment. Is that going to be enough? You know, what type of skills will people need to get into this field? I mean, uh, the analogy I like to use is I don't think it's about, uh, you know, this isn't everyone having to rush off to do STEM or everyone going and doing further maths or these sort of things. You know, it's just like when we first got Excel or Word, right? Like, it just becomes a tool. And I think what's important for, you know, parents out there and the students uh, out there is to just become familiar with these tools and to constantly push themselves to use these tools because every job will change, but it will be augmented by AI. And it's really there just to turn you into your own uh, superhero. And the more skills we get at learning how to, what we call develop the right prompt, ask the right question, you know, the data's there, the answer's there. At the moment, we just all need to get used to asking the right question. And I think that just comes through exposing ourselves in our own personal life to use these sort of available tools out there and just get our head around how the technology can help us. Do you think even as citizens, we can play a part in this development? You know, even if you're not gonna go into the architecture field or the urban planning field, or even the, the, the tech world necessarily? Yeah, um, definitely. So there's been a lot of great projects. So there's like open citizen projects globally, which sort of uh, have looked to make very uh, cheap sensing devices that you can install in your home to monitor CO2 and nitrous and oxide and all of these various different greenhouse gases. And then all of that data can then be, you know, used by the scientists to actually do it. So there's a lot of citizen participation um, things out there. I think the other thing is, is getting across to your level of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Comfort with the data privacy thing. Because mm. again, cities get smarter with more data, as you kind of mentioned. And I think we all have to go on our journey of making sure that we're aware of the safeguards that are put on that data and then making our decisions as to whether we are happy to opt in to those sort of data sharing platforms, because ultimately, you know, it's your data that helps drive the city to be better. But we as an industry need to do a better job to make sure you feel safe sharing that data so that then we can, you know, design a better city based off an aggregate view of what everyone needs. Yeah, you just want to know that it's just all going into one big pot and no one knows <laughs> that because you're breathing a lot in your house, for example, that shows that you're doing strenuous exercise or something along those lines. You know, you don't want to talk about, you know, in, uh, in law, I suppose, heightened CO2 could be, could, could be used to detect how many people are in the house, for example, you could argue. Absolutely. And, yeah. and, you know, sort of drive how we do temperature management and, you know, yeah. and lead on to smarter and more greener grids and all of these sort of things. So it's, uh, it's certainly interesting the correlations that you can get from, as you said, data that you would think is not necessarily yeah. immediately relevant. It's a really fascinating feel. Thank you very much My indeed. Pleasure. Yeah, really interesting. Thank you for coming in to the Gitech Tech Waves podcast to talk about it. Uh, thank you, Ashley Woodbridge. Have a great day. Yeah, it's been a great pleasure. I mean, what a fascinating episode uh, of the podcast. And of course, if you want to watch more, you know, interesting interviews just like that, uh, then make sure you download or subscribe to the Gitech Tech Waves podcast. You can also follow all our updates on social media at Gitex Global. Thank you very much indeed.